Hello again, and welcome to Advanced Physics for High School Students. This is Lesson 79, and it is entitled The Mass Spectrometer and the Millikan Oil Drop Experiment. These two topics are not related to each other, so we'll take them one at a time. Let's begin with the mass spectrometer. Mass spectroscopy is an analytical technique that separates a sample into its different mass components. In the current modern laboratory, there are several different techniques used to separate samples by mass. The one that we discuss in this lesson employs a magnetic field to exert forces on moving charged particles. The instrument that does this is sometimes referred to as a Bainbridge type mass spectrometer. This machine is named after Kenneth Bainbridge, an American physicist at Harvard University who directed the Trinity test of the Manhattan Project. In this machine, the Lorentz force, Fb is equal to Qv cross B, forces sample ions to move in a circular path. This technique was used to separate isotopes of uranium on an industrial scale in a machine that was called a calutron, separating uranium-235 from uranium-238, enriching the fissile isotope uranium-235 at the Y-12 plant in Oak Ridge, Tennessee in 1945, providing much of the uranium used for the little boy nuclear weapon which was dropped in Hiroshima. In a mass spectrometer, a vaporized sample is ionized, causing the sample components to become electrically charged. These ions are then accelerated and passed through a part of the machine called a velocity selector. Your authors have a picture of a mass spectrometer on page 747 of your textbook. All the ions emerging from the velocity selector move with the same speed, and shortly we'll derive what that speed is. The ions emerging from the velocity selector then pass into a mass separation region where they are deflected into a circular arc by a magnetic field. Since the ions all have different masses, the heavier ions are bent less by the magnetic field, causing the initial beam to separate out into several different beams according to mass striking the detector at different locations. The mass of the ions can be determined according to the strength of the magnetic field, the charge of the ion, and the speed of the beam as it emerges from the velocity selector. Here is the diagram your authors provide. There are three regions. A source is indicated by the capital letter A. There's the velocity selector, which is, which is indicated by region 1. And then there's the mass separator, which is indicated by region 2. The beam begins in the source and then passes through the velocity selector, region 1, and then emerges into region 2 and follows a circular arc. In region 1, there are crossed electric and magnetic fields that are employed to ensure that only particles with a certain velocity emerges into region 2. The electric force on the ions is balanced by the magnetic force on the moving charges. I have here a rudimentary simulation illustrating how the device works. Shown in the diagram are region 1, the velocity selector, and region 2, mass separator. We'll let it play to illustrate the operation. The first three particles shown each have different velocities. If a particle moves too fast, it's deflected in one direction. If the particle moves too slowly, it's deflected the other way. If the particle moves at just the right speed, it will pass through region 1 undeflected. These next particles that move through the machine each have the same speed, but they have different masses. They are represented schematically by the numbers of spheres connected to the moving particle. When the particles reach region 2, the heavier ones move in a circular arc of a larger radius than the less massive ones shown by the tracks in this simulation. If we know the strengths of the magnetic and electric fields in the machine and the radius of the paths traversed, it's possible to determine the mass of the particles following each track. Let's now look at the theory that applies to this machine. We'll begin with the velocity selector. In our diagram, the velocity selector consists of a pair of parallel plates with a magnetic field that penetrates them. 
In our diagram, the electric field is in the direction upward, away from the positive plates and toward the negative plates. The magnetic field is out of the page, indicated by these green tips of arrows. In the coordinate system that's shown here, the electric field is in the plus y direction, and the magnetic field is in the plus z direction. Now let's add an ion that is moving in the plus x direction at a speed v. This ion has a charge of plus q, and we want to look at the forces that act on the ion in such a way that the ion can pass straight through without any deflection at all between the plates of this velocity selector. In this derivation, we neglect gravity, and the reason is that we'll find that the gravitational force is barely discernible at all compared to the electric force and the magnetic force that's acting on this moving charged particle. So let's sketch a free body diagram. In our free body diagram, the charge experiences two forces. There's the upward force due to the electric field, Fe, which is equal to Q times E. In the downward direction, there's the magnetic force, which is equal to Fb, Q times V times B. We know it's downward because we could apply the right hand rule. We want this charge to move through the velocity selector with no deviation at all, which means that the electric force and the magnetic force must be equal to each other in magnitude. Now let's substitute in what those forces are. QE is equal to QVB. We find that the Qs go, and the speed at which the particle passes through undirect, undeflected is equal to the ratio of the electric field to the magnetic field. This is a remarkable result. We see the speed does not depend on how much charge the particle has. Q doesn't appear in this equation. We see that the speed doesn't depend on how much mass the particle has. M doesn't appear in this equation. In fact, any charged particle, no matter what its mass is, if it's moving at this magical speed, E divided by B, then we find that it will pass through undeflected. If it has too much speed, then it will be deflected in one direction. And that's what's indicated in the diagram above. Too much speed, and the particle experiences a stronger magnetic force, and it gets pulled downward. If it's too little speed, the particle experiences a stronger electrical force, and it gets deflected upward. Only particles that are moving at exactly the right speed will pass through undeflected. And that's what we want. We want all the particles in our beam, regardless of their charge and regardless of their mass, to pass through with the same speed. So now we have these particles emerging from the velocity selector at speed v, which is equal to e divided by b. And we want to figure out how that their mass and their radius of curvature are related to each other. So let's look and see what happens in the mass separator region. A charge of amount Q enters a region of magnetic field B with a speed of V and is deflected in a circular path. There's a magnetic force that acts on the charged particle that's given by the Lorentz force. F is equal to Q times V times B. Since the velocity and the magnetic field are perpendicular to each other, there's no sign of theta term in this expression. Now, this charge experiences circular motion, and so there is a centripetal acceleration. The centripetal acceleration is equal to v squared over r, where v is the particle's velocity and r is the radius of the path of curvature. Newton's second law says that the acceleration is equal to the net force divided by the mass. And since the only force that we're looking at is the Lorentz force, then we can say that the centripetal acceleration is equal to the force divided by the mass. Now we see we have a speed v that's on both sides, and now we see that there's a relationship between the radius of curvature and the mass of the particle. Now, the way this expression is written will depend on what it is that we're looking for in the problem. But whatever we're looking for, the velocity with which the particle emerges from the velocity selector is going to be the velocity that we're going to substitute into this expression. What I'd like to point out to you is that the radius of the path and the mass appear in the same place on each side of the equation. 
the way the equation is written here, the mass and the radius both appear in the denominator. So if one of those terms increases, so will the other one. And specifically, a more massive particle will have a larger radius of curvature. And it's by this radius of curvature that in the Bainbridge mass spectrometer, one is able to determine the mass. So going back to our original simulation up here, we have three different particles following three different paths. The smaller radius of curvature is for a low mass particle, whereas the larger radius of curvature is for a high mass particle. And in the Oak Ridge National Laboratory at Y12, where isotope separation occurred, then the less massive isotope, the one that was desired for the purposes of the Manhattan Project, was pulled away by putting a collector at the place where that smaller isotope would actually appear in the magnetic field. Let's solve a numerical problem. This is example 79.1 from your text. The electric field in region 1 of a mass spectrometer is 2.5 times 10 to the 4 newtons per coulomb. The magnetic field in both the first and second region is 0.75 Tesla. A singly charged positive ion has a path radius of 5.56 millimeters. Determine the mass of the ion in atomic mass units and determine what the element is. One atomic mass unit is equal to the mass of a nuclear particle, roughly the mass of a proton or the mass of a neutron, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Okay, well, let's write down what we know. For these problems, I usually start from scratch. So I'll begin with the velocity selector region. The forces on this charge are balanced, so the electric force is equal to the magnetic force. And now I write what the electric force and the magnetic force is. I divide by the thing that's common on both sides, and I can find what an expression for the velocity is. Now let's go to the magnetic field region. In the magnetic field region, I know that the Lorentz force is equal to Q times V times B. And since the thing is traveling in a circular path, I know that the centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. So now when I write Newton's second law, I'm going to say that the acceleration is equal to the net force divided by the mass. So V squared over R is equal to QVB divided by m. I'm trying to figure out what m is, so I'm going to solve that equation for m. And since I know what v is, I'm going to substitute that into my expression for the mass. Now notice I've got a b squared term there. That b squared comes from one b being in the velocity selector region and the other b being in the mass separation region. And since the same magnetic field is there, then I put that b there. So let's solve for the mass. My units are going to be in kilograms, and I'll have to convert it into atomic mass units. Now let's put the numbers into the calculator. I get 2 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. Let's convert this to atomic mass units. So I use the fact that one atomic mass unit is equal to 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And now let's put the numbers in. And I find that this particular ion, this particular particle, has a mass of about 12 AMUs. If I look at the periodic table, I see that that's closest to carbon. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that this particular particle is a carbon atom. It could be something else that has a mass of 12. For instance, nitrogen 12 or boron 12, perhaps. But because carbon has a mass of 12, it's most likely carbon. That's it for the mass spectroscopy part of things. Now let's move on to the Millikan oil drop experiment.